be your moderator. I'm a radiologist and chair of the RSNA 3D printing special interest group. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Christina Checker and Elsa Aribas from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Checker is a breast surgeon at MD Anderson. She completed her breast surgical oncology fellowship at NYU. Her areas of clinical interest include education, treatment of young women, and surgical innovation. Since 2019, she and her other collaborators from the Department of Breast Surgical Oncology have been developing five inventions, including two apps and three devices. She most recently was named the Innovation Officer for the department in 2021 and co-founded the inaugural Texas Biodesign Program. Dr. Elsa Aribas is a breast radiologist and professor of uh, diagnostic radiology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She is the director of uh, the Anatomic 3D Printing and Visualization Program. Dr. Aribas' work in 3D printing has been featured in award-winning exhibits at RSNA and AUR annual meetings. She has led the she was the lead author on the breast imaging appropriateness criteria for 3D printing guidelines paper. Dr. Checker and Aribas will present a talk on how, when, and why to incorporate 3D printing in the management of uh, breast cancer, and that will be followed with a Q&A session. I encourage you to post your questions in the chat box. Thank you. And uh, Alia, may I request you to uh, let uh, Dr. Checker present now, please? Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much to the group for inviting me to be with you all this afternoon. As Dr. Arribas and I share some work that we've uh, done at our institution in 3D printing and women's imaging. I have no disclosures to report. And of course, I uh, know that you all are very familiar with the evolution of 3D MRI techniques. Uh, it sounds like the plastic surgery uh, uh, groups across the country were the first to really use this technology, mostly for preoperative volumetric assessment. And then there's been a natural evolution uh, to how we can improve intraoperative guidance to achieve better margin reexcision rates. Um, our group has recently presented work about the acceptability and impact as we provide patients with individually printed models on decision making. And then there have been some early limitations that I think have been sort of common themes across the country. Not only has there been high cost, a significant technical skill and learning curve, but also a significant lead time in the production of some of these models. So our work that was presented just this last month with Dr. Santiago and Dr. Rivas dealt with the acceptability of printing these 3D models. We had 27 models we made for 25 patients. Two had bilateral disease. 14 went on to have lumpectomy and 13 had mastectomy. So in our group, we used the validated decisional conflict scale. And you see that it basically is centered around five areas of uh, interest. And we gave the patients this scale to, to um, assess both before and after they had seen their own individual model. And two things that were interesting from our work is that the scores for all of the areas, except for the level of support, had actually improved afterwards. The most pronounced change was actually noted in the patients who were initially undecided about surgical uh, planning. So this is the textbook from the Stanford Biodesign Program. I to comment on a theme that we actually found in our work, and I encourage you all to consider as you all um, think about um, the evolution of your 3D printing techniques, which is that you are encouraged to fail early and fail fast. And the reason why is because you want to actually bring back to the lab current and new iterations of the, of the design. And in this picture, I would just like to show you how our own design iteration took place and evolved. Here on the left side, you see that we have really um, an opaque or clear polymer. The area of the tumor has been painted yellow. And you see that we've taken small strips of Velcro to, to sort of hold the shape together. And as we have been using it in the OR, we added silk tape here as another way to hold it together. Here in the second panel, you see that the Velcro has now been moved and trimmed to the edges. Uh, on the right-hand side, you really see the 
iterations of our model. Here the chest wall has been painted a nice glossy dark red. The nipple and areolar complex is uh, more anatomically recognizable. And in this particular example, we were able to use a different color paint to demonstrate the effect of neoadjuvant chemotherapy so that we had interchangeable components fitted here with magnets that could be demonstrated before and after chemotherapy. I'll ask you to keep that particular patient in mind as we discuss her case in further detail. So I wanted to share three cases, all very interesting as it turns out. Our first patient had the unique presentation of a relatively small tumor size relative to her large breast size. So this is a 65-year-old asymptomatic clinician with macromastia and obesity. Her BMI was 43. Now I've put in parentheses the self-reported uh, bra size that the patient says that she wore a size 42 DB, but we know that 75 to 80 percent of women actually wear an incorrect bra size. So on her screening mammogram seen here, there was a three centimeter asymmetry and this correlated nicely on the right hand side with 3.3 centimeters on mass like enhancement. Her core biopsy demonstrated a luminal B tumor. So when she walked in, she really didn't want to discuss any surgical decision making because she said, I want bilateral mastectomy. So as a side comment here, we really don't see that in breast surgery, particularly for women with early stage breast cancer who often have the choice between lumpectomy and mastectomy, our job is not really to change somebody's mind from what they think that they want, but I do see that our role is to provide um, data so that the patient makes an informed surgical decision. So here, the challenge is bilateral mastectomy is then layered upon with complexities of reconstruction. And I think patients sometimes may see or know, have friends who have undergone breast surgery and reconstruction, and they may see photos and, and assume that, that the photos that they see are equivalent to the reconstructive cosmetic outcome that can be offered. But as we all know, all the individual medical factors must be taken into account. In this case, the patient's um, obesity and macromastia. So as we presented her model, it could not be presented or printed at 100% scale. This is a 75% scale model. And now, mind you, we introduced bias because we chose yellow paint for her tumor, but she said, look, this looks like a piece of popcorn. And more importantly, it's not a perfectly round three centimeter mass as I had imagined it. And so she took the, the model, she turned it up and down and left and right, and she said, so the empty air and negative space is just a whole lot of normal breast tissue that's removed by mastectomy, yes. So she ended up changing her mind and opted for lumpectomy with oncoplastic mastopexy. So here you see the three wires that we have used to nicely delineate and localize this area for planned excision. Intraoperatively, you see the chronic post-inflammatory skin change that she has from the weight of her macromastia. We have what's, what is described here as a witch's hat wise pattern mastopexy. You see that the areolar disc is quite large, almost um, 12 centimeters is the size of my hand. And here on the bottom left-hand panel, you see that the breast size is the size of my forearm, and here is a 75% scale model. But in working together with the plastic surgeon, the areolar disc is reshaped. This delineates the new position of the nipple and areolar complex, and she had quite a significant reduction of her breast tissue. Intraoperatively, I wanted to show what we do at MD Anderson, which includes not only the flat plate of the entire whole specimen radiograph, but also gross sectioning, which is also individually radiographed. This allows for a three-way conversation in the operating room in vivo between the surgeon, the radiologist, and the pathologist. Now, we know that that's not the resources and time that's not available um, at, all, at all centers, but this does aid us with guided intraoperative margin excision. So her final pathology demonstrated a 3.7 centimeter invasive tumor with micropapillary features. All of her margins were negative, and she was extremely happy with the cosmesis, but her postoperative oncotype was quite high. And uh, I would point out that even the genomic 
um, reporting has it's had its own design iteration as the graphics are now presented very clearly, including the risk of recurrence at 10 years with tamoxifen. And then the absolute benefit of taking chemotherapy with the NSABP trial reference that's presented below. So she ended up declining um, chemotherapy. The second patient also presented a challenge in that she had a large extent of disease and a large breast size. So this patient had overall general medical neglect. Uh, she had um, BMI of 39 and self-reported breast size of 42D. Her screening mammogram demonstrated seven centimeters of calcification with 7.2 centimeters of non-mass-like enhancement on her MRI. Multi-site core biopsy was performed to delineate the extent of her disease, and this demonstrated grade to DCIS. Now, interestingly, she came to the consultation completely undecided about any sort of opinion regarding surgery, but she said, I want to be symmetric. So in this example, again, we were not able to print at 100% scale, um, but we were able to incorporate the model into the surgical planning together with the plastic surgery team. And here, despite the extended volume of this lumpectomy, because of her breast size, um, the uh, lumpectomy was possible with joint uh, oncoplastic modest mastopexy. Here, the model demonstrates the extent of the disease. The orange um, polymer demonstrates the individual radioactive seeds that were placed for bracketing. And the patient says, gosh, this looks like a piece of coral with fingers and it's not round, like, like I expected a lump to be. So intraoperatively, um, here we demonstrate the very modest circumvertical mastopexy incision. We've marked at the skin the location of the seeds, and you see that her tissue is quite totic. So this is actually her axilla, and her breast tissue isn't even on the table at this point. It's just hanging to the side here. But by use of this circumvertical incision and the elasticity of her skin in general, we're able to provide nice operative exposure for an on-block resection of this area. And you see here that we are comparing the supine positioning of the breast versus the model that's based on prone positioning. Postoperatively, you see that you really cannot tell that we have been here. She was very uh, happy with her cosmetic outcome. We're able to preserve symmetry without requiring a contralateral procedure. Her final um, margins were all negative. There were 6.8 centimeters of disease, but this did include microfocal, um, multi multifocal, pardon me, uh, invasive tumor. So she returned for a central lymph node biopsy, which was negative, but she really helped us out with intraoperative surgical planning. Our last case involves the patient who you've already seen, who had a triple negative cancer, measuring about 6.6 .6 centimeters on mammogram, including some calcifications. And here on the right-hand side, you see that it measured 4.7 centimeters on MRI. I draw your attention to the fact that although we did not think that there was overt involvement of the muscle, there is really quite a tight plane of tissue here she proceeded with neoadjuvant dose-dense ACT. She was very motivated for breast conservation therapy. And her post-treatment MRI demonstrates not only a decrease in the overall size of the lesion, but also an improved plane along the muscle. It was interesting to also compare this to her model. Now, this included DCIS, included a satellite lesion, uh, and although this is place side by side for your visual comparison. This obviously does not include the correct anatomic location for both um, lesions, but you see that we also have an increased space here posteriorly at the muscle. So she underwent lumpectomy. There was 1.4 centimeters of residual invasive cancer with 30% residual cellularity, and then there were four centimeters of associated DCIS. So in my mind, it makes sense why not only the size of this model remains these dimensions, but also why you really didn't see too large a difference between the pre and post treatment modeling, it's because it also included DCIS and we don't expect DCIS to have responded to therapy. Um, Postoperatively, she completed Keytruda on a SLOG protocol. 
Last week, we had the pleasure of performing the very first Cairn Surgical Breast Cancer Localizer case here at MD Anderson. And this is our surgical colleague from Dartmouth, Dr. Uh, Rick Barth. Um, he has published some work involving supine MRI printed um, modeling um, versus wire localized lumpectomy for breast cancer and the impact that this can have on margin assessment. So uh, this, he flew down from New Hampshire for, for this case. You see here on the left-hand side that his um, jointly founded company provides the modeling in a cartoon rendering. The blue here is the muscle. This is the polymer model that you see here that he's holding here. The purple area is his tumor. And then these are predetermined, pre-printed ports for the guide wire placement that the surgeon actually places. So these have predetermined depth and also spacing. So for me, the interest here is that when the model is based on the supine anatomy, it looks less like the models that we have used in our preoperative planning and more like a, almost like a breastplate. The guide wires are introduced to the ports. Here you see that we have the, um, four cardinal wires that are placed at one centimeter away from the margins based on that supine MRI. And here was the specimen radiograph intraoperatively. The four cardinal guide wires have been removed and the primary guide wire has localized the clip at the second bead. So this was our very first case as a multi-institutional um, study that's under investigation. And uh, we hope that you all will be looking at anxiously as we will be awaiting the, the trial data from the study. And in conclusion, I wanted to share the lessons that we've learned thus far. We have found that although our work involved the acceptability for patients in terms of reviewing their own individual model, what we found surgically is that a tumor-specific model was a very valuable teaching tool and a decision-making aid. Uh, we found that it was most helpful when describing the size relative to the breast. Uh, the patients sometimes have a predetermined idea of surgical choice, and this does not always correlate with a clear understanding of the size relative to the patient's individual breast size. Uh, we found it extraordinarily helpful when explaining the concept of margin. Most patients simply don't understand what's wrong with us surgically. Why can't you just cut around it? Why can't you just figure out where the margins are? Why can't you just uh, uh, look with your eyes and see where the tumor is? And here, the common theme that we saw is that patients, when we talk about a cancer, a lump, a mass, a tumor, and we say that something is an inch or three centimeters in size, people are picturing a very perfectly round spherical uh, tissue. And that is not actually what these um, tumors uh, bear out to be on the 3D modeling. The limitation and the challenge for us intraoperatively, particularly with those first two patients I was able to share with you all, is that prone versus supine positioning, it often yields two very different anatomic locations. And as expected, yes, we do lose some fidelity printing at the smaller scale, as well as with greater size and ptosis. And yet, those were the patients in whom the model was very helpful. As expected, and as demonstrated by that third case, there is limited neoadjuvant assessment, especially when there's extensive DCIS component. Now, you all will laugh, as Dr. Arribas really laughed at me, when I suggested that our next design iteration should be to allow us to dis distinguish areas of calcifications versus of the mass. But, of course, we would love that if our imaging was uh, allowed us to, to really do that. So we found and conclude that 3D models have value in addition to decision making, not only for intraoperative localization and potential margin delineation, maybe in those centers who don't have the intraoperative resources to really uh, provide intraoperative margin guidance, but also when planning oncoplastic or reconstructive operations jointly with plastic surgery. And lastly, in the um, enthusiastic sharing of this protocol with our radiation colleagues, as we were um, showing these models, it was very interesting to hear the radiation team also comment on the value to them as a downstream, downstream multidisciplinary team. Often they are, and of course they have expertise in the, um, using the 3D guided imaging 
planning for their, their beams, you know, um, cross-sectional CT images, but they're often examining these patients after surgery has occurred, after the onchoplastic closure has occurred, and sometimes it's not always so easy to discern where the tumor may have been. So they actually really like these models as well. Um, I thank you so kindly for your time and attention, and I want to allow Dr. Arriba to have the most amount of time here to talk about the technical aspects. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. Just, um, mm -hmm. uh, Aliyah, if you could make me uh, okay. the presenter. Thank you. So now that um, Dr. Cheka has actually um, gone over um, some of the cases that we've done and, and the uses uh, in terms of the surgical perspective, I just kind of want to give a little bit um, also different perspective on our models as well. Um, I do have a disclosure. I'm in the advisory board member for Volumetric Inc. And so, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the uses. Uh, I also want to talk about the imaging and the 3D model. Just real quick, um, uh, there's a, you know, the use in education. Uh, we talked about surgical planning and multidisciplinary care. Um, and later on, we'll, we'll give a, a quick overview of the imaging and the actual 3D model. In terms of the uses, um, we want to talk about the education, of course, patient education. She mentioned the study that we did together where, um, you know, we, we tried to uh, do some shared decision making and see if there was any significant impact on that. Uh, a 2016 study demonstrated that 38% of the cases, uh, poor communication had a direct impact on patient care. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that we can avoid some of that decision regret, um, which, um, you know, comes from either some sort of uh, patient physician communication or miscommunication, uh, insufficient information regarding the treatment options, and of course, um, also insufficient information on adverse side effects. So our study was an acceptability of 3D printed models, and um, we wanted to see if it was acceptable and um, whether it changed the decisional conflict uh, on, on treatment related um, uh, decisions based on, on breast cancer patients that were considering surgical options. Um, as an example, this is one of the cases that we did, and this is a, an MRI where we have the axial um, image here of the breast the patient had bilateral breast cancer, and then bilateral sagittal imaging. She had right breast DCIS and IDC, and also ADH, left breast DCIS, um, and she was going for surgery. And then this is the actual model that we created where, um, as you can see, um, that's the areas of um, ADH, DCIS, and invasive, uh, both on the right and the left breast. And this is a rotating model that they can actually see as she was describing the volume of the disease. Um, so in terms of numbers, um, we noticed that there was a significant reduction in the overall decision conflict scales following the review of the 3D model, um, and, and this was of um, from 64 to 76 percent. Um, so their model was deemed acceptable according to our numbers, and it also improved uh, the decisional conflict in patients uh, considering surgical management. We also used it for uh, training education. Uh, we're in the um, process of doing a study where we're trying to teach um, them the um, Byrex lexicon or have them see if, if these models can aid uh, in their um, learning the Byrex lexicon, especially in MRI. Uh, this is uh, an example of what they describe as non-mass non segmental uh, enhancement. This is the actual MRI image. And then here we can see the actual model um, of the representation of the MRI image and then the uh, rotating MIP as well um, on this so that they can actually uh, see if there's any difference or improvement in terms of uh, learning. We've also used it um, for surgical planning, uh, not only for surgical excision, but also for breast reconstruction. This is an example of um, deep uh, uh, reconstruction uh, where we um, go ahead and in and this, and this CTA, we will segment out uh, the uh, perforators uh, that are in, and kind of point out where they're coming at. And this is a rotating um, image of what we have segmented. Perfect. 
printed out the vascular map, and then it was transposed onto the abdomen. Um, the results or preliminary results showed a decrease in the margin of error uh, in surgical interventions, uh, decrease in OR time, and a decrease in uh, surgically related complications. So we have uh, noticed that um, our 3D models can accurately depict the extent of disease in relationships to the adjacent anatomy of interest, and they can also be used as surrogates for complex preoperative localizations. Um, as Christina also said, um, you know, it enhances the communication between the breast imager surgeons and plastic surgeons, and now we're uh, definitely talking about radiation oncologists and uh, even um, uh, breast oncologists um, in evaluating response to new adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, planning the volume of excision. She talked, we talked about the uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy on this case, and of course, the planning of the um, excision. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about the imaging um, and technical considerations. So, breast imaging modality, um, we use uh, MRI for 3D modeling because um, it gives us the extent of disease uh, and the tumor volume based on the total breast volume, which we have found that it is important uh, for both uh, patients and surgeons, of course. MRI can provide this information very accurately, and it can also provide information on the pertinent or at risk surrounding anatomy, meaning the chest wall or the skin or even some vascularity. Um, we are um, also looking at when we're creating these models, we want to make sure that it is accurate. And for that, we want to do multimodality correlation. That means that we need to compare it with their either breast uh, mammograms or their ultrasounds to make sure that what we're seeing on the MRI, it is the total extent of disease uh, that we want to look at. Um, we want to look at the enhancement characteristics and how they change with the adjuvant chemotherapy and also the background parenchymal enhancement, which can kind of confuse um, the lesions that we're interested in looking at. This is a case where we saw a lady that had multifocal invasive ductal carcinoma and DCIS. This is the area of calcifications here in a CC view of um, the breast. And then this is what we saw on breast ultrasound uh, as extent of disease. And here um, we see imaging, uh, axial imaging of the breast MRI demonstrating uh, the uh, non mass enhancement in the upper inner breast. The patient also had an implant. And here we can see how it accurately correlates um, with the area of. Um, calcification seen on the mammogram. And here, this is the actual tumor sitting on top of the implant and kind of giving um, both the patient and the surgeon accurate um, visual uh, evaluation of the volume of disease versus the volume of the breast. This is the second case in which the patient also had calcifications. This is a, a magnified view um, on the CC on the left breast and again uh, on the lateral breast showing the area of calcifications. This patient underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And this is a breast MRI showing minimal enhancement. However, there is still um, architectural distortion in that area, which we were able to accurately segment. And this is the actual model in here um, where it shows uh, the area of disease, which correlates with the area of calcifications. However, the enhancement was um, not really um, the same. So it's very important that we do that correlation. Our third case, um, which shows um, how we need to evaluate also background enhancement and how it, the models can actually help um, when looking at disease uh, in a breast which has background enhancement. This is a case of a patient that had a fibrinoma, invasive lobular carcinoma on two. Wanted to remove all areas. Um, this was the MIP on the MRI. And this was actually the rendering on the model that we did showing um, all four areas uh, distinctly and differently. However, if you look in here at the model with a clear resin, we can also show the areas of um, that wanted to be resected of tumor and disease, and we painted them in different colors to kind of highlight uh, where the areas were, and it definitely gives you a better perspective of what needs to be removed. 
There are some technical uh, limitations to um, 3D uh, printed models. They will only be as good as the imaging data used. So if you have poor imaging resolution, you will produce poor prints. Um, also, the imaging protocol should be tailored if possible to increase this resolution um, and depending on the intended use. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the actual 3D model, the segmentation, the printing and the processing of what we have been doing. Um, so, as I said before, the intended use will determine the design, how you want to see the design, how you want to articulate it. And, um, of course, after some experience and different iterations, as Christina mentioned, we will be able to um, do this uh, to the best possible way and advantage for both the patient and the surgeon. So we need to figure out the anatomy to be printed and how to best display it. Uh, the print ratio, uh, as she uh, showed a previous case, we printed it at 75%, uh, but most of the time we would actually like to print at the actual size of the patient, which gives them a better perspective of what we're dealing with and also the materials to use and what is important to highlight. And these are some of those examples. Um, but first, we're going to start with generating the print file. We're going to obtain the MRI, select the anatomy that we want to include in the print, segment that anatomy using either commercially available or open source software, and then do some quality control. Make sure that the areas that we want are actually segmented and that they've been segmented accurately. Going back, then we'll send that file to the printer uh, and using the printer software, we'll prepare the print and actually send it to be printed. Um, choosing the materials that we believe are going to uh, best enhance this print. Um, and after it's printed, of course, you do some post processing um, that has to do with either painting or magnets or whatever else uh, you choose to do to your print to get it prepared to be shown. Uh, this is just a, a little uh, imaging uh, showing uh, how we've segmented the different areas and how they look on uh, both the sagittal, axial, and coronal images uh, to make sure that everything is the way it should be. And um, here it shows um, the actual model, how it's supposed to look uh, right before we print so we can make sure that everything looks accurate and the way that we want to see it. Again, talking about selected anatomy and post-processing, this is a patient where we did everything with clear resin. We actually painted the nipple so that that would show more clearly and we painted the tumor. However, we noticed that giving it more color, um, painting the chest wall would add depth and a little bit more perspective um, to the actual model and show um, the areas that we want to highlight a little bit better. And that is one of our models. Again, um, highlighting the selected anatomy. This is the patient's chest wall. We printed it all in gray and the tumor was printed as well. You can barely see it there. However, when we did highlight it in yellow, you can definitely see the tumor much better. Uh, it is important, um, you know, the material that you're using, the color of the resin and how you want to highlight it. We chose to do clear resin so that we can actually see through um, the skin into the area. Some people have used lattices. Uh, there's all different sorts of designs and you just have to use the one that is best for you. And we also chose some Velcro to attach um, the areas of, 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 of the breast basically. And we've also chosen um, to use magnets as well. Um, I just wanna acknowledge uh, financial support provided by the Jonas Dunn um, Distinguished Chair in Diagnostic Imaging and the Robert D. Martin um, Chair in Diagnostic Radiology. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cheka and Dr. Aribes for an enlightening presentation. That was really informative. It was very informative. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think there's a question from the audience. Again, for the uh, participants, if you have a question, please post it uh, at the chat box and Dr. Aribas and Dr. Cheka will be happy to answer them. So I think Dr. Cheka, there's a question here. When would you choose radioactive seed versus savvy scout localization? I can't see who asked the question, but I sure do thank you for it because I uh, have a strong opinion about this, which is that 
I think, and I feel like I've benefited from during my training in the evolution of the localization techniques now to uh, working in different facilities, I think that it is very valuable to be facile in all techniques if the opportunity presents itself because it allows the surgeon and the radiologist to choose the optimum technique based on the patient anatomy. There have been um, instances, particularly for the patient that has got the very fatty replaced breast with a lot of ptosis, sometimes the mammographer may prefer the placement of a guide wire. There may be more precision and confidence that the hook wire ends at the target location. At our institution, we actually, this question is easy to answer because we've evolved um, since the time that we did these cases, and we no longer have radioactive feed available here because of the regulatory issues and the fact that the concomitant um, other devices were available on the market, including the savvy device and the mag feed. So uh, we have the mag feed, the savvy device, guide wires, radioactive seeds are no longer used, and we know that there's other devices that people are also using, including the radio frequency um, tagged devices. So I do encourage for all of you, whether you are joining us from a surgical or a mammography group, please encourage trainees to uh, gain confidence with all techniques. You'll never regret it. Thank you. Uh, Elsa, we have a question for you. What software do you use to uh, use for 3D modeling? And how long does it take to create each breast cancer model? Yes, so um, we are currently using Materialize uh, Mimics, um, but we also use Materialize Inprint as well. Um, in the beginning, uh, we were using Slicer, so Slicer software can also be used but we, um, of course, um, realized very quickly that um, for us, using uh, Materialize was um, a, a faster option. But there are other commercially uh, available um, software out there um, and also freeware. It just depends on the what you want to use it for, right, and what is approved and, or how you feel about um, its accuracy. So that being said, um, the actual... Um, Processing and building of the model depended on the size, uh, as you can see, and also on how uh, intricate, intricate, sorry, the um, the treatment was. So if we're talking about some, uh, you know, non-mass enhancement that is, um, you know, multi-centric, then that will definitely take us a little bit longer. If we're talking uh, in terms of the segmentation, and, and then if we're talking about uh, creating a a really large breast model. And that will definitely um, take us a lot longer in terms of printing time. So I would say anywhere between, you know, two to maybe six hours uh, of the segmentation, depending on on how how quickly we can, you know, we can figure it out. But on average, it was probably more around two to three hours uh, in terms of the the actual segmentation process. And uh, to print, how long does it take? The print time, like I said, that that's just. Um, I guess it will it will be between um, twelve and then thirty six hours, depending on how many parts you want to print it in. Uh, if you're doing it as a whole part, or if you're doing it in multiple parts, it just takes a little bit longer. Um, also, depending on how many printers you have, right? So if you have multiple printers that are all printing at the same time, and that definitely um, sheds some time in the printing process. It's also, I have another question. I think uh, many uh, participants asking the same question. Uh, what printer do you use in your lab and uh, who segments the data? And, okay. and the last uh, is uh, the million dollar question. Who, where does the funding coming from? Where is the funding coming from? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, in our lab, we currently use form labs um, printers. Um, and that's what we used uh, for these models. We also have a Stratasys um, uh, 350. Uh, and so, um, and then we're hopefully um, going to be obtaining an uh, Ultimaker very soon. So, um, and, but all of these models were done with a Form Labs uh, printer, which I think it's pretty economical um, when, when comparing um, you know, with other printers as well. Um, and then what was the second question? Sorry. Who segments okay. the data? 
but uh, the other thing is that they also want to know whether it's, whether it's Formlabs 2 or 3. Yeah, that's. Yeah, so these were done with Formlabs 2. Um, uh, you can possibly, I mean, if you get, I guess, if you get a 3L, you can probably do a lot of these um, quicker as well, because those are faster. Um, so um, that's the other thing. And then you have a bigger bill volume in there, right? So you can do multiple different parts uh, within the same within the same build at the same time. Um, we segment, um, we meaning Dr. Santiago and myself segmented all of these cases because um, we were doing it as a, as a research, sort of like a little research project. Um, but right now we have uh, our biomedical engineer, Karthik Tapa, who has been doing all of our um, other cases, um, not just breast, but other types of cases. Um, and then the last question was about the funding. Where does the funding come from? And that's very interesting. So we, as you saw at the end of my slides, we we got some grants uh, to do our projects. And um, I think it's right now, it's pretty much a big of a mishmash. Uh, some people have grants, some people have some sort of funding. So it's all sort of been internal. And um, we're, we're exploring, um, you know, once, once we're, we're kind of, um, have everything in, in place to start uh, billing to insurance uh, for the models that um, you know are, are already been sort of vetted um, to be charged to insurance. So I'll keep you posted on that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cheka. A question for you: mm -hmm. uh, Are printed models used with all uh, surgical breast patients? I would uh, like to add another mm -hmm. question to that. Yeah, do you think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who really benefits? <clears throat> what kind of patients really benefit from these models? Do, you know, do, do you think every patient needs a model? I definitely do not think every patient needs a model. Um, I think there's other things that we can incorporate into the clinic to aid in surgical decision making, including uh, the surgeon being facile and being able to um, review imaging together at the bedside, particularly as we've moved to electronic health records, and now most exam rooms are equipped with, you know, the ability to show the screen there. Um, I would say that small unifocal tumors probably benefit the least in terms of anatom anatomic implications for surgical planning. Um, in our study for the acceptability of the models, recall that we use the decision conflict scale before and after the patient held the model. And we know that the higher score predicts greater decision regret, greater decision delay. And it could be that that scale is used you know, at the onset of the visit or before the visit to demonstrate maybe the few patients that really are conflicted. Um, it could be that a model helps those types of patients, but I strongly do not see the value of um, the expense and the time for small unifocal uh, lesions. I think that the other layer of nuanced decision-making that we definitely saw play out in, in our cases, including with these models, is, is the plastic surgery component. And we have work that's ongoing here at MD Anderson where we're trying to pair patients with somewhat individualized information, in other words, based on breast size and based on um, BMI, those options and those results look differently than a patient who has a 32A cup size breast and weighs 115 pounds and has no medical comorbidities. So I think that we are going to see greater tailoring of decision-making aids, both for the uh, breast surgery portion, but also the plastic surgery reconstruction. But I would be, I would definitely caution groups that are incorporating 3D printing to be judicious and try to work together as a multidisciplinary group to come up with some sort of algorithm that you can have some definition of the patients that might likely benefit the most and in whom you should then spend those resources. Thank you so much. Uh, Elsa, there's a question for you. It's a, uh, there are two, uh, two parts to this question. One is, have you ventured CPT codes? And uh, the second question here is, uh, will you consider submitting these cases to the RSNA ACR 3D printing registry? Yes, those are great questions. So um, we are um, in the process um, of, of venturing those CPT codes, uh, but we haven't yet. 
and um, yes, we are um, participating or we'll, you know, I think we're in the process of doing the whole um, signing up and then sending uh, the cases over to the registry. Uh, so the answer to those questions are yes, but not yet okay. in the process. Uh, I have a question, I think, to both of you. You know, um, what do you think about uh, AR and VR technology? Uh, do you think that shows precise anatomy while compensating for the limitation of uh, 3D printing? I guess I'll take that one first and then I'll, I, I'll hear from Christina because I know she has her perspective on that as well. So, yes, um, AR, VR definitely um, have have tried it, not with definitely not with breast cases. I, I do think um, that there is um, a place for that. And um, I think that trying to find that, like Christina said, trying to figure out exactly where that fits um, versus using the models. I, I have noticed that um, even when, even people that are used to looking at some of these images, when you show them the rendering um, and, 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 you know, that it's hard sometimes to actually um, look at perspectives um, and so it'd be interesting to try to to try to really narrow it down uh, which patients would benefit or you know surgeons um, in terms of planning would benefit most from the AR VR versus the actual model mm -hmm. um, and then um, but I know that the patients love to just have something in their hands and just kind of helps them uh, digest better all of what's happening uh, because they're not used to looking um, at images and um, anything mm -hmm. uh, in terms of video games or virtual reality, um, Christina. I share that, that that thought that you just mentioned that I think patients lack the ability to make that connection intuitively and easily about converting an image and then making that connection to one's own breast size. The model really allows the patient to have that um, intuitive connection. However, there's tremendous value in AR and VR in a couple of other uh, perisurgical um, and imaging applications. Number one is um, the, the clear values education. So uh, we are starting to take a, a keener look at this here at MD Anderson. We have a company who's coming, I think, uh, next week or in two weeks, coming to visit with the orthopedic oncology surgeons. But we, you know, I, I wanted to tag along and see what they have. And I, I do think that this highlights one key point that innovation ought not take place in a silo, and that even as we are examining different departments, different devices, there could be cross-pollination of ideas and collaborations that come. And I think that the, the intimate relationship between imaging and uh, surgery must continue when considering AR and VR. So I think that there's value for um, education, not only of the imaging, but also the surgical trainees. And then um, I have to say that that has tremendous appeal to thinking about what we started out the Q&A session with, all the varieties of localization techniques. So imagine being able to um, have that overlay or onlay, have uh, you know haptics that direct you surgically and intraoperatively, not only to the lesion, but perhaps also to margins. So I think there is more to follow. I do think that it, it, even for the patients who may use this as a component of their gaming, I think it would be difficult for, for them to have the connection that we saw in the clinic with the 3D printed model, but I'm always open to, to the next acceptability uh, pilot project for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, Dr. Checker, you know, uh, your presentation was awesome. You uh, showed some great models, but I had a question. Uh, did any of your patients choose mastectomy uh, after seeing the model? Like, you know. Yes, sir. So that's an interesting question. So actually none of them chose mastectomy based on the model, but we did have a patient who had extensive bilateral recurrence after bilateral breast conservation therapy. And the ultrasound in this example really understaged the extent of disease. And although the patient, I, I was already trying to lead the patient to the conclusion that repeat bilateral lumpectomy would not be possible because of the need for radiation, that being our limiting factor there. But in her example, it was really the extent of disease bilaterally. 
printing the bilateral models and having the extent and the extension to both the nipple area complex and also the muscle posteriorly really helped that patient more rapidly accept the surgical plan. So we did not have someone who was undecided and that the model led them to mastectomy. We saw the reverse where the model led them to change their mind from bilateral mastectomy to uh, lumpectomy. Definitely found a patient who required mastectomy, and yet the model aided in the emotional acceptance of the surgical recommendations. Okay, thank you. I have uh, two questions from uh, the participants. One is, uh, mm -hmm. do you think the, what is, what do you think is the greatest benefit of printed models for a surgeon? Is it uh, surgical planning, decreased OR time, cosmetic outcome, all of the above, or something else? I think it was surgical planning for the volume of excision. I, I have to admit that even I changed my intended volume of excision in seeing the models, especially those examples that I highlighted for you all where there are you know, fingers or sticules that extend out or being able to examine the position of the satellite nodule, for instance. So for sure, it helped me with surgical planning for um, the volume of excision. Also, the, the plastic surgeon, that was really helpful because we could get a sense for um, how extensive a mastopexy was needed, how much reduction of tissue was needed. Um, the the um, preference I would say is that if I had to choose prone or supine, there is no doubt that the supine printing more clearly reflects the supine positioning. Interestingly, I understand that fidelity is lost as, as we have to downsize the scale, but that didn't present to us as much of a challenge the um, significant difference between prone and supine positioning. Um, as far as the um, oncoplastics or the reconstruction and the cosmesis, I will say that it helped us plan the right oncoplastic choice or intervention. Um, the plastic surgeons, they have their own list of available options, um, a menu of, of tricks, if you will, and I think that that helped them as well. But this was incredible to be able to have this model. Again, what we did was provide the model in clinic to patients, but what was fascinating was the amount of information and um, experience that we gained by being able to hold the model together and talk about it together, just like Dr. Reba showed with her surgical colleague in that photo. Um, that was just so darn fun. Okay, thank you so much. I think there was a question about change in uh, position during surgery, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the lesion. Uh, I think you already answered that, so I think that is fine. Uh, Dr. Arabas, I have a question for you. Uh, what do you think about the supine MRI technique now? Is this something, uh, is this a better modality for printing these models? Or uh, how is that going to change as a, as a radiologist? How is that going to change your practice? So we're just exploring um that those options uh, right now, I think that there is definitely um, a place for supine breast imaging uh, for specifically when you're using these models, because like Dr. Cheka just said, um, the fidelity of, of, of the lesion where it's located, uh, it's just the same as when they're going into the OR, uh, minimal shifts in terms of moving the arm up and down. But other than that, uh, it's it's pretty much the same and it that will definitely um, help them a lot more uh, in terms mm -hmm. of, of, of the excision of the area. Um, as far as the volume, I think it's about the same uh, pretty much, but um, just being able to do it uh, in the same position as the one that they're operating, uh, just, you know, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll see, um, but, but I think it will definitely be worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Uh, we are right on time. I think we are just one minute to go. Uh, if there are no other questions, I would like to end this uh, uh, this session. Uh, 
I would like to thank all of you for your time, uh, to take your time from your busy schedule to be uh, here today. Uh, special thanks to our speakers, Dr. Cheka and Dr. Haribas. That was a wonderful presentation, and thank you so much for answering all these questions. And special thanks to uh, our RSNA team, Alia Khan, Brian, and Chris Carr. Uh, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, without you, this uh, wouldn't have been possible. Again, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all so much. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm.